Hey there, it's Rachel Mullins, the host of Hashtag No Filter Fridays on Public House Media. I'm Nicole Kelly, and I'm a speaker and an activist. And hi, I'm Sarah Tuberty. I'm an occupational therapy student, a flight attendant, and an aerial artist. We both live with a disability. We both were born with a congenital limb difference and are hosts of a new podcast, Disarming Disability, coming to you on Public House Media. So come learn, explore, and understand disability so we can deconstruct these social stigmas and really build a more inclusive society. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or at publichousemedia.org. Come hang out with us every Wednesday. Also follow us on Twitter at Disarm Disable, Instagram and Facebook at Disarming Disability, and check out our website at disarmingdisability.com. Bye. Another edition of Your Soccer Passport here on Public House Media. My name is Bryce Burge. And I'm Ivan Sanchez Carrasco. Uh, Bryce, we got to thank God for Real Madrid. They're giving us a lot to talk about. We're also going to touch some of the other Champions League matches. Uh, the women's national team came in a lawsuit to the Federation, and we're going to touch on the Champions League here in Congo Cap as well. All right. Well, let's start off with that Real Madrid situation. Uh, Zidane is back in. Uh, as as the leader of that that team, uh, especially after Real Madrid has basically had their entire season start heading down the tubes, including an absolute blowout uh, against Ajax uh, in the second leg of the Champions League. Uh, this is just not a good situation for Real Madrid right now. No, it's not. And essentially, in seven days, they... Lost to Barcelona in the Copa del Rey, then, and that eliminated them. Then Saturday they lost to Barcelona in a Clasico in the league, which put them 12 games back and essentially out of La Liga. And then four days later they got blown out by Ajax in the second leg and eliminated them from the one trophy that's really been keeping them in and it's kind of set them apart from everybody else in Europe, the Champions League. And finally the king is dead in Europe, finally, after – three championships and four and five years, they're finally no longer contention to make a Champions League quarterfinals or semifinals. Well, you know, the thing is, is that going into this season, it seemed like there was discussion about whether or not this was the time to rebuild and retool. And and that was one of the reasons why Zidane left Real Madrid to begin with. And now, now that it seems like it's very obvious that they have some problems and that there are, that they are struggling the way that they are, it, it, they bring him back in. And now it creates a whole new situation where it's all drama the rest of the season for Real Madrid. And it's more of a soap opera style where it's just like, all right, well, are they going to get, you know, what are they going to do with, with Bale? What are they going to do? with uh you know the the Mbappe versus Hazard argument you know what's their goaltending situation going to look like it, th- there's so many possibilities for this offseason to go because pretty much everything is open and and able to be changed I think after how bad things have come along but ultimately that comes down to Z- to Zidane and the leadership in Real Madrid and, and it's just going to be a real big interesting thing to watch i actually thought it was shrewd for real madrid to bring him back because number one it gives them stability for the next year and you're not wondering what's happening the rest of the year do we have a lame dub coach um they get up they get him now before any other teams are able to get him um if with they lose if they want to change coaches so i think that was shrewd and smart by their part and you know what kind of this reminds me of this real madrid team especially in that ajax match and we see it all the time and uh, in sports, you saw it in Spain at the World Cup four years, uh, eight years ago. You saw it in Germany. You saw it with Germany's last World Cup, where you have all these players who don't this cr- group of core players, and there's not a lot of change within the team. 
and until and things go well until they don't and all of a sudden it kind of comes crashing down something from another sport example it happened with the lakers after they won their two championships in 2009 2010 they get swept by dallas the next year in 2011 and you just kind of see when there isn't a lot of change you know all of a sudden it goes from consistency to complacency and i think this kind of what happened with this team and I think now the rest of the world should be worried because for the last five years, Real Madrid hasn't really bought anybody, any big names for the most part. And they've kind of kept this core group together. These, the team that won them all these trophies in this, you know, the starting 11 never really changed. And now you're going to see a wholesale of changes. And I think the rest of the world, all these other clubs should be worried because Real Madrid are going to go after their best players now, something they haven't done for the last half decade. You know, the thing about that is is that even though that you still have Real Madrid going after these players, it's just another group. I mean, for me, even though that I know that Real Madrid is is one of the big names, is a name that's going to attract a lot of people, you still have major players that have been shilling out money in Man City, in Paris Saint-Germain, Uh, You started to see it a little bit in the Italian league. The Italian leagues are starting to pop up a little bit more with grabbing some of those players. And, you know, even though that you've got another player on the market, I think, I think ultimately things are, are diluted enough between those leagues that even though that, that they're going to hit the market and there's another player on it, it doesn't, I I don't think it's going to be that big of an impact in the overall free agency market of trying to get that kind of stuff. I think I think where it comes out more is where players go on loan and which players get, get bought out. I've, I see transfer fees going through the roof, and I think that's where you're really going to go out and, and see those players because even though that you can bring in players on their own free will, you're going to have a lot of players that now are going to be brought out in transfer windows, and those transfer records, I think, are going to start falling pretty heavily here with, with Real Madrid ha- hitting the market like this. Well, yeah, with that core group, I see at least five of the guys no longer being there. And Modric, Cruz in the midfield, Bale probably, Bale's definitely out. He never got along with Don. You know, you have Benzema probably playing his last couple of matches. And so I think uh, Casemiro even, the defensive midfielder, probably might be out as well, depending on what Zidane wants. And, you know, these are guys who've been there for a while now. And so there's this first, their first time hitting the market in – in five and for Benzema in a decade. So everything is going to go up the players they sell and the players are going to try to bring in. So interesting with the timing of when they did it because they, you know, just looked like an old guard getting beat by a younger, fresher, hungrier team in IX. You, even with that regard though, I mean, you, you still have certain aspects of this champions league though, that I think was a little bit surprising with how it all came down. I mean, you know, Porto's also moved on and, and to try to transfer a little bit more into just general Champions League discussion as a whole. Tottenham just completely rolled Dortmund. Uh, Man United had to win on away goals with a, a very impressive game against PSG. You know, and then you even get to some of the games that are popping up at the day of broadcast or the day of release between Lyon and Barcelona or, or Bayern Munich and Liverpool and and you see some some odd things in this Champions League this year, you know. There's it's just interesting in that regard. Yeah, I think the uh, you know PSG. You know that um, the PSG loss to Real to Man United kind of reminded me of the that hold my beer meme because first Real Madrid goes and stinks up the place, and then a day later PSG is like, oh, you think you can choke a game away? Hold my beer, watch this because they had a two goal lead entering. Uh, going to going back home to Paris and they blew and they were they blew that within a half an hour a half an hour of the game and I think Paris the Paris loss is a bigger is a bigger choke job than the Real Madrid job just because they had a two goal lead entering the second leg and Real Madrid and United were depleted of players they had to use a lot of their academy players in that game and so another team who's probably gonna make wholesale changes PSG but yeah when looking forward to the next round of the Champions League you see a lot. There's just, there's a lot of possibility for an interesting matchups and possibly, you know, some surprises that could make a run. Porto, one team that you mentioned right there, Man United kind of still has that upset look on them just because when you compare them to some of the elite teams in Europe, they just don't have the depth that they do. And then yeah, you look if 
Atletico Madrid can hold off Juventus. Now, all of a sudden, they will have a good proposition going forward, if depending who they match up with. So this makes the Champions League much more less predictable and makes it more interesting in that regard. Now, Juventus needs to get two goals, three three goals to win, two goals to tie. But even at that point, they have to they have to score at least three goals uh, to get past Madrid. Um, when I look at at the other games, though, Bayern, Munich, and Liverpool, Barcelona, and Lyon, those those games are tied zero zero. That that's a straight up winner take all scenario in the games of of release date for the show. Uh, out of those two games, which do you think is going to be the more entertaining one? I think Liverpool, Bayern, Munich, just because I think Barcelona has too much quality playing at home to, and they'll be able to stifle uh, Leon. But I think, you know, Leon Leon's in an interesting spot where all they need is one goal, and that's going to force Barcelona to have to score two because of the away goal rule. And same thing with Liverpool, Bayern, Munich. But that first game, even though zero zero between Bayern, Munich, and Liverpool. I thought the pace was good, and I thought Barcel- Bayern Munich did a good job of kind of stifling Liverpool's attack to a certain point on the field. They never – Liverpool had a few chances at Neuer in goal, but they never created real clear-cut one-on-one chances where he had to make a world-class save. He had to make some really good solid saves, but for the most part, Bayern Munich did a really good job of stifling the Liverpool attack to a certain point and then countering, and Liverpool did a good job of recovering as well. So I think that game is the one that – to keep an eye on for the most part just because of the quality that's going to be on the field and how both teams decide to kind of approach the game. I think that, I think that was, that was the one for me. How about you? Um, I would probably have to go with Atletico and Juventus with looking at that one. And, and, and I know that I kind of broke the rule in, in, in which game would be more exciting. I don't think Bayern Liverpool is going to be as exciting just because I think both teams are going to try to play to their strengths which means that the ball is not going to be moved around as, as much as they want to. I think it's going to be a more cautious game with everything kind of on the line. I, and I look at what Lyon can do on the road. They've got nothing to lose. So if, if Lyon just goes out there and is willing to have faith in their goaltending to stop stop shots on a counterattack, I could see Lyon just growing everything up front in the first 30 minutes trying to get a score and then falling back once they get it. Um, which is not your typical scenario for Champions League games, but against a team like Barcelona, it could, you know, and on the road, I mean, I'm not really sure what else you would do. So, you could, you know, depending on if Lyon can score in the, that first half, that first 30 minutes, uh, I think that's going to make a more interesting game out of the two that are tied in uh, on uh, Wednesday. Though I do think the most interesting match is going to be Juventus and Atletico Madrid. Out of the out of the four games left to play, yeah, and you make a good point too. Just because Juventus really need to go and attack, and that kind of fits into exactly what Atletico want to do with their counterattacking style, and they have to not only get one, but they got to get two, and they can't allow Atletico to get a goal to to get a goal because then the away goal rule goes into that one. But yeah, that one that one's int- that one has the most intrigue just because of the characters on the on there too. Because you got Simone on the bench, you have Ronaldo. And you have a Juventus team who kind of been on the cusp of European glory again, making two finals in the last uh, five years. And they just haven't been able to get over that hump. And if they can't get over the hump right now, it's it's a, kind of similar. Like, what do you do with what do you do now with this core group of players to yourself? If you're Juventus, it's a lot to ask from them because domestic these teams, Ju- Juventus, PSG, they're measured in European success as much as they are domestically just because they're a shoulder above everybody else domestically. So this is huge for um, Juventus entering the game. With them being so far down, is there a moral victory if they can force, let's say, a tie and still lose on away goals? Is there um... – and you know, is is there a situation where they don't necessarily start asking the questions about their their internal core group of players and still not make it out of this round? No, because I think that's why you bought you you spent all that money to bring in uh, um, Cristiano Ronaldo. You didn't but, bring but him you, in for you, moral victories. But you just brought him in. Like, how much time? How much time do you you give? 
one of the best players, if not the best player in the world, a chance to work with your core group. Well, when he's thirty, when he's thirty-three, I think I think he's thirty-three, going to thirty-four. You don't have much time to to get the best out of him. So, and I think that's why they, I think they brought him in to be that. Fun, hopefully, they were looking for him to be that final piece, that one that uh, that makes those critical goals in those critical situations that he kind of seemed to do so many times for Real Madrid. So you only have one or two, three seasons of him, of what you expect a peak Ronaldo entering his late stages to be able to produce that. So, you know, you don't have that much. I don't think you are given that much time. And this was a really big risk reward for Juventus to spend all that money on someone where they're only going to get two years, three years of him at his, what is considered to be his best. So I think, I think that's the real, I think that's kind of the real thing. And then, if it doesn't work out, do, are they another team who's now kind of now working and fitting new pieces around him? Are they kind of reshuffling the whole core group too? So, yeah, this a lot of questions got to be asked about Juventus if they don't make it out. Lots of changes on the horizon for teams in the Champions League. It's uh, it's the times they are changing, and uh, it will be interesting to see how it all pans out. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll talk about the U.S. Women's National Team's gender discrimination lawsuit, as well as a little bit of the CONCACAF Champions League as well. You're listening to Your Soccer Passport here on Public House Media. This is John Lauder, host of The Cheap Seats here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, The Cheap Seats, where we talk about sports from the fans' perspective. A new show comes out every Monday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of The Cheap Seats. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Soccer Passport here on Public House Media. Bryce Bird, Devon Sanchez Carrasco here as well. Talking now about the U.S. Women's National Team. Uh, we've talked about them a lot just because we're ramping up to the World Cup this summer. But another potential distraction has popped up for the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. Uh, but it is an important issue as well as the team has sued the U.S. Soccer Federation for gender discrimination. 28 members of the world champion United States women's soccer team has continued their fight over pay equity and working conditions, filing a gender discrimination last Friday. Uh, It's filed in U.S. District Court in Los Angeles, and uh, it talks about institutionalized gender discrimination that has happened for years not only with their paychecks, but where they play, how often they play, how they train, the medical treatment and coaching they receive, and how they travel to matches. Uh, There's some big names in the the lawsuit. Alex Morgan, Megan Rapinoe, Carly Lloyd were some of the ones that popped up in the the names uh, right off the bat in the actual lawsuit. And uh, this just continues a fight that's been happening for a long time. Uh, with the United States women's national team. Yeah, um, a very shrewd, I said shrewd earlier, talking about Real Madrid, this is even a more shrewd move by the women's national team because they did it on Women's Independence Day and they did it on a World Cup year, so when there's the most um, eyes on them, and this is right after the She Believes Cup, so you, it was very well timed on their part to get the most attention to where to raise the most awareness, and that was the first thing that, took my eyes of the whole situation was the smart timing by them to kind of in this little kind of area where they're able to get the most eyes, most attention. And with that will come the most, you know, backlash to the federation to, and now people will look into this issue more, I think. And, and the United States women's national team has done an amazing job. They've been a really a, a world leader with this kind of stuff. The way that the U.S. Women's National Team has fought over gender equality and, and the way that, that it's formulated between the men and women have been picked up by WNBA players. It has been picked up by 
uh, the professional hockey leagues for the women in both uh, the, the CWHL and the NWHL. Uh, you've got uh, the Canadian Soccer uh, Federation paying attention to this. And you also have uh, uh, the Australian leagues. And the Australian leagues are, are arguably the number one equal leagues in terms of men and women in the world. Even the Australian leagues are starting to pay attention to what's going on, especially with the basketball leagues that they've got down there, as well as the A League. It, it's it's truly amazing to see this pop up, because yes, they did it at the right time, but even after the She Believes Cup, I think we argued about whether or not that style of tournament was worthwhile going after, and that's something that can pop up in the, in this discussion. It talks about coaching staffs. It talks about how they're paid. It's talked about equality, and and there's a lot of a lot of different schools of thought in this process. And I see, I see that there's been improvement over time. But is it enough improvement? Is it sustain? You know, is the the smaller improvement been sustainable compared to just giving them all that they want now? It, it's a very it's a very big business aspect that I think a lot of people that have not had a chance to work in professional or highly, you know, high level amateur sports kind of really miss out in terms of what it takes to get this stuff done. But at the exact same time, we very obviously have seen so many problems with FIFA. We've very obviously seen so many problems with the United States soccer federation in terms of how they've handled the women's team. So, it's it's a big debate on multiple fronts, and it's very confusing to kind of start breaking it down. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest problem because about trying to cipher through all this is that all the little parts and all the things that come with it, because you want to talk about, you know, part of their argument is the success they have on the field, which is, you know, unquestionably much larger than the men's and everything like that. The problem is that the pool in which the competition is is much smaller they are a big fish in a small pond, and I think that's the biggest problem. The biggest uphill battle they face is how small the pond in women's soccer is compared to the pond in men's soccer when it comes to you know, trying to find out what what is equal pay related to the equal – to what the men's – what's the equal equality of what the women do for the women's – for the national team compared to what the men do just because the professional leagues are different. Which will which will put you into the international days, which are different, which leads into these tournaments like the She Believes Cup, which the men don't have something equal to that because there's not a need for it. I guess you know if I'm making myself clear. I don't know, like all these details. I mean, yeah, they, they you are, and I think that's kind of the problem is that how much of it is, let's say, a discriminatory aspect compared to the free market working itself out. And yeah, and th- that, that's, I think we that's all want issue. we all want the women to have the best possible accommodations they have because they deserve it because because these are world class athletes. We want them to have the best coaching. We should they should be able to fly. You know, if the men are flying in charter flights to these tournaments, the women should be able to fly charter flights to these tournaments. For, but I get and not take not take that argument away, but I guess for the men. They're getting a charter flight to Trinidad and Tobago to play a World Cup qualifier. The women don't have to go to Trinidad and Tobago to play a World Cup qualifier. Their World Cup qualifiers are a two-week tournament in the United States played all in like one or two locations. So I'm and like in that regard, you know that's that helps out the women's national team because they're not going to these places. They're not doing all these. They're not doing uh things like that. And I guess. That's an example I, I can think of at the top of my head where there's a difference. So how do we how do we realize that it's different, but then how do we figure out what's the equal part of that difference? Well, e- even at that that point, you know, even though that you're you're consolidating these things, they're not necessarily for the United States' benefit. They're for the benefit of small countries to improve the ga- the women's game as a whole. Women's soccer is still trail trailblazing. How many? How many countries in Africa and Asia and the Middle East do not have women's soccer teams because of the oppression on, on women? We have a problem now in the United States and, and in other places in, in the, the rest of the world to match up with the inequality that we see in Iran, in North Africa, in some places in financing these Caribbean teams. They they just they barely have enough money for their men's team, 
and they don't have the stress or importance on a women's team. And so if you're bringing everybody in for one one centralized tournament just to make sure that you have another team that can play because you're not you can't get a Trinidad and Tobago to make seven international flights to do their to do their side of the World Cup qualifiers, then they don't compete. The United States is not shackled only on the situations presented by the U.S. Soccer Federation, but they are shackled by the, the international pool as itself. And I understand being a big fish in a small pond, but really when you look at when you look at it, the men's soccer game is an ocean and the women's soccer game is a river. And it is traveling and it is all over the place and there are rapids and there are challenges that they have to deal with. It is it is not a comparable scenario to look at that. And so the difficulty for me is that if the United States wants to make significant imp- improvements in things, then equal bonuses would be a very big start because the bonuses for winning is not the same. And that should be the same because that's based on everything internally that the U S soccer federation could do. You've got playing conditions that I think is a big one because if you look at the training facilities, you could be using similar training facilities or you could be using indoor facilities that that are more multi-purpose that have higher quality to them where it's not some some indoor facility for like a D2 college football program. Instead, you're going out and you're using actual soccer-based things and having those resources available to the women's side as the men's side as possible because then you could also share resources like trainers and yeah. healthcare staff and nutritionists and stuff like that there are small things with put them in a nice financial. hotel yeah well, yeah put them it's, in the, it, put them in the yeah it's yes. non-financial in... infrastructure that could be that is the big difference i think in making equality between the men and women because there's no way to make the money necessarily equal out with the exception of performance-based bonuses those should be equal yeah they need to fix the no the no-brainer stuff the no brainer crap, like like you said, uh, equal facilities, put them in the same quality hotels, things of that nature, little things that you shouldn't even think about that should just be that should just come from it. Um, and you know what would have been a great you know what would have been a great idea when it comes to having sharing facilities? Remember when I said that they should have a national stadium? Yeah, baby. If you just had a national stadium, they would can, all be sharing the same thing. You and can I, have national practice facilities without having yeah. national stadiums. They do that with cricket. They do that with rugby. They do that with indoor soccer. They do that with the Olympic wrestling teams uh, in Colorado at Colorado Springs. You know, the, there are there are places where you can practice together, and it's not that big of a deal. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's just – it's common sense stuff that I wish that – We have the ability to talk about openly because I feel like for us, you know, we kind of knocked on on equality in in itself, not necessarily because we were we are anti equality, but because we're trying to figure out a way to make it work. I think that we've gone past the point of necessarily understanding that we need equality. And now we're talking about nitty gritty stuff where there are still people having the argument that the women are not equal to the men regardless of performance, regardless of anything, because they're women instead of being men. And I do want to make sure that our listeners, as well as anybody else knows flat out, we're Americans, and I am damn proud of the work that our our athletes do to be on our national team. And they, to be, they deserve to be treated as the American stars that they are. And if you have that kind of thought process, I think you avoid the whole men and women situation and you focus on treating your American athletes with the respect that they deserve because they're going out there and winning. I mean, yeah, you can even make the, I mean, there's definitely an argument to be made that um, Hope Solo and Alex Morgan are probably the biggest stars in soccer in general for 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 Americans right now, besides maybe Christian Pulisic. I don't think if those three are walking down the street, I think, hope Alex Morgan probably gets recognized for Christian Pulisic by the random person. So, I mean, yeah, they deserve to be, they deserve to be, it just kind of seems like a common sense kind of a thing, which is why it's like frustrating to have to like repeat it and talk about it. Like, yeah, duh, this should obviously, they should obviously have the facilities needed to compete at the best possible um, quality they need to be competing at. It's like, duh. Duh. Yeah. That's, duh. How, that's how we're going to go with it. United States District Court in California. 
But, um, yeah, so we talked a while um, on that situation. We'll just give you an update on CONCACAF Champions League in that regard. In leg one of two, uh, Santos Laguna won 2-0 over Red Bulls. Dynamo also lost 2-0 to Tigres. Monterey won 3-0 over Atlanta United. And the MLS continues their problems uh, with Sporting Kansas City being the only MLS team to score a goal, but still losing 2-1 to Independent. Uh, the final leg of the quarterfinals are the day of recording tomorrow or Thursday. Uh, Santos Laguna Red Bulls and Tigres Houston will be tonight of recording. Uh, Atlanta United and Monterey will be the day of release at 8 p.m. And then Sporting Kansas City and Independent will be on Thursday, also at 8 p.m. all times Eastern. Let's go to the shout out to make sure that we've got time here. Who's your shout out, Yvonne? Uh, Hector Herrera, captain of Porto. We mentioned Porto real quickly, but Mexican midfielder, captaining Porto to the quarterfinals. I'm on, I'm on Team Porto now to have the Mexican lead Porto to Champions League glory. All right. Good luck to Porto and good luck to them. And hopefully you didn't jinx them like you usually do. That's right. Oh, Sorry. I, I know for sure. I, <laughs> I know for sure I won't jinx this. Liga MX dominating MLS, baby, in the Champions League. I know I cannot jinx that one. Okay. Yeah, that that one would be pretty obvious at this point. So, yay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Until next time, you can listen to Your Soccer Passport as well as all Public House Media shows on Spotify, Spreaker, iTunes, and more. Until next time, I'm Bryce Burge. For Ivan Sanchez Carrasco, you've been listening to Your Soccer Passport here on Public House Media.